creative process my whole life. I come from a family of artists and architects. I'm a principal of an architecture firm, and I teach at the Rhode Island School of Design, where I teach not only art, architecture students, but artists as well. And I've never done this. I've never brainstormed. I've never thrown out what I know at the outset of a project in, um, in order to generate ideas. In fact, I think it's safe to say that I try to induce almost a state of uncertainty about what I thought I knew through questioning and dwell with the empty table, the blank page, and an open mind. Um, and this is something, I think an open mind is something that you need to learn how to do. And, it, and you learn it by doing a lot of unlearning of what you thought you knew. It's what I do with the first semester students in architecture. And I do that basically by giving them a daunting problem, something that's completely unfamiliar. They just get thrown into it. And it, it, part of that, it, I also give them some inspiration at the same time. In this case, with this project, it was in the form of cellular material that they looked at through the microscope. And they were asked to build a three-dimensional structure just from what they saw there. And I gave them a very difficult, stubborn material to work from. And the reason why the stubborn material was given is because whatever plans they had that they came in with, that they wanted to do, they can't do. The material doesn't want to participate in it. So the material goes between the preconceived idea and the revealed idea, which is a great place for making discoveries. And they, they really do. They come up with amazing ideas about structure and space and order that they incorporate into their architecture. And I call this state of grace, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know where this is going, but I have to do this. Because somewhere in that state of uncertainty, something comes up, and you must follow it. As Jake did when he built this gravity suit and it formed his life work, or Dutch did when he followed his shadow from sunrise to sunset when he was designing an observatory and wanted to understand the celestial sphere. For myself, I would say it's this two-year period when I was living in Rome, I had these very vivid dreams, and I just decided I wanted to record them because I wanted to refer back to them. So I started to paint them without any intention of showing anyone these dreams. Um, but then something started to happen. Um, I, I, there's a lot of them. There's about 250 paintings. And somewhere along the way, I would go, this is really stupid. I'm not, what am I doing this for? This is a waste of time. And then something would happen that would surprise me and shake me to my core. And I think it's safe to say, and I, this is being completely honest, about 50 of these dreams were prophetic in some way. I found myself at a later date walking into the space of the dream. Um, so one example is a dream I had about a garden, my father's garden. Instead of having flowers and vegetables in the garden plots, there was body parts, a clear, cleanly severed foot, a torso covered with a veiny pattern, uh, a brain, and they were arranged in these floating in this mud in these garden plots in a skewed pattern. I could see all the plots at once without turning my head. And then there was a bat, and I had no idea what the bat was, but I knew I had it in my dream, so I just put it in the, draw in the painting. Well, a few days later, I went to uh, the Sistine Chapel to visit the restoration of Michelangelo's Last Judgment which is the end wall of the chapel. And the restorer took us up the scaffolding to the upper right corner where there's this pendentive where the end wall, and the two walls meet the ceiling. And on that pendentive was this dirty rectangle obscuring you know, parts of the figures beneath. Uh, he explained that the restorers keep that there so that future restorations can have this as a specimen when their techniques improve. And then there was this torso with this fine veiny pattern. So I said, what's that? He said, well, that's uh, water damage from the roof that seeps through to the fresco depositing salts that are irreversible. So I started having that uncanny feeling, sensation of synchronicity. And, um, and then I started looking around. The scaffolding was cut, cutting my view. So I just saw parts of figures, something that looked like a brain. And even the bat was there. Uh, the bat swings on, on Sharon's boat in hell. Now, so I thought, all right, I have to share this with people somehow. It wasn't, I wasn't trying to show my art or anything because I'm not an artist. So I printed up 10 post, postcards of 10 of the paintings and I surreptitiously placed them in postcard wraps. <laughs> <laughs> and I restocked them as they sold. Some of them, some of them came back to me. Um, but another person who is Carl Jung, who painted his dreams and his fantasies and accredited that time as the source for his later years work where he coined the term synchronicity as a kind of intellectual intuition or memory backwards. Um, I would say that period of my life was also very fruitful and it has defined what creativity is to me as, as um, seeing ahead. Um, so.
If you, I have some postcards if you want to send them around. Yeah. <laughs>